What joyous singing this morning. What a joy to gather as a body and to be able to, uh, on this Thanksgiving weekend, thank the Lord for his abundant blessings, but most of all, for what he did for us at the cross. That is the purpose of our gathering this morning. We will commemorate the Lord's Supper, communion together as a body, as a family. It's our joy to do that this morning. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1. This week in my morning reading, I've been in Paul's uh, letter to the church at Ephesus. In chapter 1 and in verses 3 through 14, Paul gives praise to our God because of the rich spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. Paul is exuberant in his praise, exuberant in his delight in what God has done for us. And this morning, that praise, uh, these blessings should be our praise, our exuberance also for all that we have in Christ. And in fact, Paul calls us to worship, calls us to adore the Lord in verse 3. You know likely that this is one long sentence in the Greek, and uh, I think Stephen has said from here that most English teachers would, uh, would, would squirm at the length of this one long sentence. But this morning we will look at particularly one verse, but let's look at verse 3 first. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You see the word bless, blessed, blessing here, one form of it, several times in this verse. It has a little bit different meaning each time. When Paul says the first word, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's calling us to adore him, to praise him. He's claiming and exclaiming, really, that we are to praise our Lord. We are to worship Him, bless Him, bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has bestowed blessings upon us. He has given us these spiritual blessings in Christ with every spiritual blessing. That is, we could look at that as benefit also, every spiritual blessing, every spiritual benefit in the heavenly places. This is similar to David's exhortation in Psalm 103 and in verse 2 where he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. And so Paul calls us to that kind of praise, to that kind of adoration of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the preceding verses, he continues to give us a list of many of the blessings that are ours in Christ. We read these verses this morning already as Aaron Let us in responding uh, to the scriptures, to what God has done for us in Christ. And so our time this morning, uh, we don't have time to really look at it in depth at all these verses, obviously, but we want to prepare our hearts to observe communion, and we want to follow our Lord's command to do this in remembrance of him. And so our focus will be on verse 7 simply. So look down there, if you will, at verse 7 with me, where Paul writes, Simply this, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Last week, if you remember, we sang the song, There is Power in the Blood. You remember singing that? It's a lively version of that song, There's Power in the Blood. And this morning I want us to consider the wonder-working power of the blood of our Savior as we look at verse 7. Paul gives us two blessings that we see here as we look at this verse Blessings that are ours because of the blood of our Savior. The first one is that we have been redeemed, he tells us in verse 7. In him we have redemption. There are three different ways our English word redeemed has been uh, used in the New Testament. It comes from three different Greek words, actually, and each of them has a little bit different nuance as it's used in the Scriptures. But here, the usage simply means to liberate by paying a ransom in order to set a person free. Slavery was common, as we know, in the Roman Empire. Different commentators give us numbers that are vary a little bit in the number of slaves that there were. Some say as many as 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. And those slaves were often purchased. They were sold for a variety of reasons. But here, this idea... Uh, to to, uh, liberate someone by paying a ransom in order to set the person free. This carries the idea of someone who would purchase a slave for the sole reason 
of setting that person free, to liberate them, liberate their, uh, their life, as it were. And that's the picture that Paul is giving to us here. Before we came to know Christ as our Savior, we were captives to sin. We were slaves to sin. And to be set free, there was a price. There was a ransom that had to be paid. Had to be paid so that we could be free from our position of slavery to sin. In volume two of a study in the Gospel of John entitled, When Heaven Came Down, written by our pastor, Pastor Davy writes this about chapter 8 in verses 34 through 38 of John. He says, The Jews were walking around proud about their assumption that they would live in the house. That is, they were members of God's family since they were related to Abraham. Jesus says to them, in effect, You aren't spiritual sons. You are slaves to sin. And just as a slave may live for the moment in the master's house, he's not part of the family. He has no right to the family fortune. This isn't his house. And if the master wants to, he can sell the slave, fire the slave, imprison the slave, or kick the slave out of the house. A slave isn't guaranteed a future. Only a son has a right to call the house his. He would go on to write, The truth, Jesus says, is that humanity is held captivity, held captive by sin. And again, that's us. Before we came to know our Savior, Jesus Christ, we were captives to sin, we were slaves to sin. But in the same passage that Stephen writes about in John chapter 8, we hear Jesus say this, these words in verse 36, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. How did Jesus provide for our freedom? Our freedom was accomplished in what we commemorate today. That is the death of our Savior on the cross for our sins. We know the verse in 1 Peter where he tells us, You were ransomed. And that word ransomed there in 1 Peter Chapter 1, verses 8, verse 18, is the idea, it's, it's the verb form, basically, of that noun that we have looked at in chapter 1 of Ephesians. We have been redeemed. We have redemption. We have redemption. So you were ransomed, Peter tells us, from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 tells us, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus Christ that is, he himself likewise partook of the same things, the same things being flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Brothers and sisters, we were slaves before we came to know Christ as our Savior. We were slaves in bondage to our sin. But what does this freedom look like? Christ went to the cross. He paid the penalty for our sin. He shed his blood for our freedom. And what does that freedom look like then? What does that mean? Why do we still sin? Let me explain it this way. Through the Holy Spirit, who now lives in us, we have the power that is the ability to live in victory over sin. As ones who are in Christ, we now follow the Holy Spirit. But because we live in a fallen world and still live in this flesh, we still do sin, don't we? Paul expressed his lament in Romans chapter 7 when he said, The things that I would do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And again, it's because of that very truth that though we have been redeemed, our purchase price has been paid. We have been set free from the power of sin. We still live in this flesh. We still live in a sinful world. But those sins that grieve us, they don't characterize our life if we are truly in Christ. As Jesus explained to Nicodemus, we have been born again. We have received a new nature. One resource described it like this. Whereas the old nature drew us towards self-pleasure, the new nature tugs us toward holiness. I like that phrase, tugs us toward holiness. You see, that's the, that's the experience we should all have if we know Christ as our Savior, that the new nature within us tugs us toward holiness. 
To be free from sin means it no longer wields the power it once did. The stranglehold of selfishness, greed, and lust has been broken. Freedom from sin allows us to offer ourselves as willing slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ, who continues to work in us to make us more like him. Can we give praise to the Lord this morning? We should give praise to him. Paul calls us to bless God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because we have been redeemed in Christ. We have been set free from the slave market of sin through his blood. There's a second blessing in verse number seven that we rejoice in today. It's the fact that our sins have been forgiven. Paul says it again, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of of our trespasses. That forgiveness is ours at great cost, though, because, again, the focus of our remembrance of this morning is that of what Christ did on the cross. God has not acted in some grandfatherly way and has whimsically or casually dismissed our sins just because of his love or of his grace. The record of debt still stands against us. So what has he done for us? We were with family this, uh, this week. We were with our two sons, and we have four grandchildren with those two sons. And there were a couple times, actually a handful of times, when uh, one of their little ones, two or four years old, wasn't doing what they should be doing, and uh, our son would take them aside and uh, apply uh, a little discipline to their seat. Now, as a grandfather, I sat there, and I jokingly would, I, I would just kind of, oh, don't do that to that sweet little guy or that sweet little girl. How can you do that? And I would joke with them and say, you know, you really shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's terrible. Knowing that some 30 years ago, I did the very same thing to their, <laughs> to their little rear ends. That's what a grandfather does, but that's not what our God would do. You see, because of his justice, his justice uh, requires the forgiveness of sin be paid There's a penalty that has to be paid, and his justice requires that. The Bible is clear that the penalty of our the consequence for our sin is death. We read that in Romans 3, in Ezekiel chapter 18. And the penalty was carried out when Jesus gave his body on the cross and shed his blood for us. We have forgiveness of our sins. The word forgive here, forgiveness means to carry away. The word takes us back to a ritual performed on the Jewish Day of Atonement. And on that day, the priest would take a goat, kill it, and then he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat before the Lord. He would next take a living goat, and over that goat, he would confess Israel's sins. And then that goat was taken far into the wilderness with the intention that it be lost. It would never find its way back to the town never find its way back to the people. And that is the picture of what Christ has done for us when he went to the cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Our sins are carried far away, never to be found again. And again, we can rejoice with Paul and say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. David describes it like this. You remember we said uh, he, the benefits, forget not all his benefits. He described it like this in that same psalm, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And so this morning, as we come to observe the ordinance of communion, we do so with solemn hearts, knowing that great cost, knowing the great cost that our Savior paid to purchase our redemption and to provide for our forgiveness by paying the penalty of our sin. So we do so with somber hearts. But let us also bless the Lord. Let us adore him, to worship him for his abundant grace, which was lavished on us so richly, so freely, to allow us to be free from our slavery to sin and to offer us the forgiveness of Christ. We ask that only those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior through repentance and faith participate in our communion this morning. If that doesn't describe you, please simply observe. And I would ask you to even reflect on these words, these brief words that we've seen this morning. 
The truth is that you can be set free from the slavery of your sin, and you can know God's forgiveness. Paul would go on to write in this same letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, By grace are you saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I would encourage you, if you have not experienced that life-giving grace, that you would speak to someone who's close to you, maybe who's partaking in the communion, and ask them after the service how you can know your sins are forgiven. Know that you can be set free from the penalty of your sin and from being a slave to sin. Can we pray, please? Father, thank you for your abundant grace and love expressed to us in our Savior and in his death for us on the cross. Jesus, thank you for bearing our sins in your body and paying the penalty of our sin with your shed blood. Thank you for providing for our redemption and for our forgiveness. I pray in Christ's name, amen. We're told in 1 Corinthians that whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So would you do this please with me? Let's spend just a moment of quiet communion with our Lord in a spirit of repentance and thankfulness for what he has done. The Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Our Father, we have commemorated the death of our Savior with solemn hearts, but it is also with hearts that rejoice greatly. We bless you, O God, for you have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, we give you thanks for the spiritual blessings which are ours because of what our Savior accomplished for us on the cross. Father, we rejoice in that. You predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of your will and to the praise of your glorious grace, the grace with which you have blessed us in our Savior. In him, we have redemption through his blood. In him, we have the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of your grace, which you lavished upon us. In Christ, you have displayed your purpose to one day unite all things in heaven and all things on earth in him. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. In him, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, your guarantee of our inheritance until we take possession of it. All this to the praise of your glory. Father, thank you for these blessings eternal blessings which we have today because of our Savior Jesus Christ who went to the cross to bear our sins in his body and to shed his blood for our redemption and our forgiveness. We bless you 
And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.